afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Prioritizing Diversity and Inclusion in Course Design. I'm Diana Ren Rapp. I'm the Assistant Director of the Atlanta Global Studies Center. We are a national resource center that engages the region's global agenda by supporting foreign language instruction, global education, and research. I'd like to thank our partners today um, who helped make this program possible. The University of Georgia's Latin American and Caribbean Studies Institute, the Center for Latin American and Latinx Studies at Georgia State University, the Georgia State University School of Public Health, and Spelman College. And now I'll turn it over to Inez Cordera, Cordero, sorry, Da Silva Diaz, from Spelman College. Hi, thank you, Diana, uh, for moving forward with this conference uh, that was supposed to have happened uh, in person. And thank you, Carlos Eduardo and Carlos Pio Eduardo and Carlos Pavão uh, for, uh, for your presentation and your questions and everything. I'm very looking forward to this. So I'm gonna present right now Carlos Pavão, who um, is going to mediate the conversation. Uh, Carlos Pavão is a clinical assistant professor at the School of Public Health, Georgia State University in Atlanta. Dr. Pavão is bicultural and bilingual and immigrated to the United States from the Azores in 1977. In the early 1990s, Dr. Pavão started his public health career in Fall River, Massachusetts, as a community organizer in HIV prevention and operated several tobacco control and substance use community coalitions. Dr. Pavel has expanded his public health work to in also include mental health community planning. Throughout his career, he has focused on the nexus between dissemination research and innovative public health programming specifically for linguistic minority populations. As a public health practitioner, he has worked at the Portuguese Youth Cultural Organization and STAR both in Fall River. He also worked for the new Bedford Mayor's Office. He later worked for Educational Development Center, conducting national public health planning and implementation, capacity building, sustainability planning and evaluation with state level public health directors and Caribbean public health territories. In 2007, he was selected by Dr. Elias Zerhouni, um, director at the National Institutes of Health to serve a four year appointment on Directors Council of Public Representatives. More recently, he has collaborated and evaluated public health programs with marginalized populations in Houston, Atlanta, and Nashville. Dr. Pavão is presently conducting a national study on Brazilian immigrants and working on the book, Exploring Portuguese Speaking Health Disparities. He has published on immigrant and sexual minority health disparities and serves on reviewer on several academic journals and a brand reviewer for NIH. So, Dr. Carlos Pavão. Obrigado, Dr. Cordeiro de Silva Dias. Um, I think the lesson there is I want to make that bio a lot more shorter for next time. But um, as do Dr. Ren Rapp uh, kindly introduced the webinar today, I think from a practitioner perspective and also an academic perspective, this is going to be a very cutting edge and thought provoking webinar. Uh, especially, especially in thinking about language and how language interfaces with different disciplines. So as a native speaker, uh, for me with a public health focus on the intersections of critical race and critical theory and exploring how language can actually look beyond the pieces of just the kind of the, uh, the normal way of, you know, of speaking, whatever the case is, and incorporating different ways of thinking about language is also very, very critical in a time where we need to think about cultural competency. So now what I'm going to do is, is introduce Dr. Carlos Pio and Dr. Uh, Eduardo Viana da Silva. So Dr. Pio obtained his PhD in Hispanic languages and literature and uh, with an emphasis in medieval studies from the University of California in Santa Barbara. He is also a lecturer in foreign languages um, and he's located at the University of Pennsylvania. He has taught Spanish, Portuguese, a graduate seminar in medieval Liberian literatures and languages, 
and also um, has focused on literature and cinema from Lusophone, Africa, Brazil, and Portugal. Um, the Tour Eduardo uh, Viana da Silva uh, also received his PhD in Luso Brazilian literature with an emphasis in applied linguistics from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Um, while he was at Santa Barbara, he also earned an interdisciplinary degree in teaching, which is called the Certificate in College and University Teaching. Uh, presently, he's a lecturer and coordinator of the Portuguese program at the University of Washington in Seattle. And his main areas of interest are applied linguistics, Luso Brazilian literature and culture, and um, with, a, uh, with a specific focus looking at curriculum development with a focus on culture, task based language teaching, and global citizenship. So, what I'm now going to do is turn it over to Drs. Pew and um, Viana da Silva for their presentation, and then we're going to follow up with a moderated discussion. Um, so now I'll turn it over. So I think I'll take it from, from here. <clears throat> I'm Eduardo and I'll start the presentation. And then uh, I believe I'll talk for about 10 minutes and Carlos will continue. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the organizers for the event and thank you Ines for inviting us. Really appreciate it. So the project that we have here is an open textbook and the idea of developing an open textbook for Portuguese came from the fact that both Carlos and I taught Portuguese for over 15 years. And you have been in the classroom teaching uh, beginning level classes, intermediate, advanced level classes. And after a while, we thought we should have a textbook that was written by people who are in the classroom teaching the classes. Um, and we thought this would be a good opportunity and the two things that we wanted to, to do is to make the book free um, because the textbooks for Portuguese are expensive. Textbooks in general are expensive, but the one we used was about $200 with a two year access to the online workbook. And we thought, well, let's do one that's open access so teachers can use, adapt, uh, change the textbook as much as they want. And we also wanted the book to represent the language, how it is spoken by people in our countries and in other countries that speak Portuguese. So I'm gonna share this screen, go straight to the book. It's called, I'm sharing with you a version of the Brazilian Portuguese version of the textbook. It's called Bate Papo. Uh, here's the link. I can probably copy this link and put on the chat later on. So the way we did, here we have a table of content. And um, just if you look at the introduction, and explain what you can do with the book. So it's a creative commons, CC BY. And we did the, the simplest version. So people can share, they can cop copy and redistribute the material. They can adapt, they can remix, transform, change the material, even for commercial purpose. If someone decides to make a package and put in the copy center of the university, they can do that. Uh, and we just ask that they give attribution uh, to you know, where the book came from. But those attributions are already on the pages of the book. And I'm just gonna skip this. We the way we did, we went to Brazil and we counted with the collaboration of a lot of people, um, mostly students from UNESP, that's the University for the State of Sao Paulo in the city of Araraquara, and also the University for the State of Minas Gerais. So this group of students, they would record dialogues that didn't have a prompt, it just had a prompt, but didn't have, uh, the lines pre-done pre or any kind of rehearsal because you want it to be very natural. And these are some people from my state in Brazil, Santa Catarina. Um, so if you go here, the attribution is there again, right? CC by 4.0, CC by 4.0. Um, let me, 
go back and show you how we did the inclusion in this textbook. So we thought of inclusion, um, I'll give you three examples. One is in terms of gender. Our, we are very intentional in how we portray gender in the textbook. So I marked here one B. That's a beginning class, right? It's an introduction to Portuguese. So we have the set of tasks, you know, what students will be able to do by the end of the lesson, you know, a lot of lists and answer some simple questions about their daily routine. Then, let's see here if I find them. It's right here. So normally, one thing that we thought we could do to portray gender in a non-traditional way, non-conventional way, is to change the order. So when you present ela, ele, she, he, we present ela first in one chapter, and then we change the other chapter and do ele, ela. So that's one way that we, we thought we could um, present gender in a different manner. Uh, the other way we did that as well, let me change chapters here. In 2B, we use the X symbol for non-binary gender. And we just put a note here. So explaining that uh, even though in Portuguese you have the feminine and masculine form for most um, adjectives and uh, nouns as well, uh, some, you know, at least in the written form, you can put an X at the end. Uh, just like we use Latin X, you could do this as well. Um, this is something that we're still working on. There is also the letter E that we should introduce here. Um, so in terms of gender representation, that's, a, that's one example. And in terms of race, and I have to be very clear that, you know, both, and I think I speak for Carlos on that too, we don't think we are specialists on race issues but we are learning and, um, and as we negotiate our own race and our own whiteness, uh, we, we think of things that we can apply to the textbook. So for 2B, not 2B, I believe it's 4. I got a little lost here, maybe 4A. Oh, here, there we go. So what we did is instead of, you know, normally a lot of traditional textbooks would bring to the forefront of the chapters, um, someone that's um, a hero of, of the country or someone that's um, um, normally a white person that has some power. And we thought that in this book, we'll do the opposite. We'll create uh, our beginning of chapters and not just the beginning, but the whole body of the chapter would have protagonists that were not just, you know, the white presidents of our countries, but also other people that have that had a very great, a big impact and that come from minority groups. So in this case, it's Maria de Franco, for anyone that's familiarized with her, she, she was a social activist. She was the first black woman that was part of the city council in Rio and that was assassinated in 2018. Um, and, you know, this would create a dialogue in class, but since it's a lower level class, some of these things students would read at home or we can give them a, a link uh, of things that they can read about it as well. Um, so in terms of uh, race and diversity of accents as well, we try to record people from, uh, with different accents. So this person who is speaking here. Ice cores. 
uh, has, uh, is from Olinda, which is a very different accent from Sao Paulo and Rio. That's what you normally find on textbooks. Jaqueta verde. Camisa branca. Calça preta. Vestido amarelo. Um, let me see. Let me go to another example of our representation of our heroes could also be people who are not extremely famous in the country, just like the social worker, Maria de Lourdes Giango, um, that we chose to open this chapter with, right? So that's another example of how to diversify uh, the presentation of the textbook. And one example with the recordings that we did in Brazil and how we brought that to the material. Let me get here. So this is a dialogue that we took from a recording from the University of uh, UNESP, Universidade Estadual Paulista for the state of Sao Paulo. So if we look at the dialogue for people who speak Portuguese or Romance language, you can see here that in this sentence, well, this person says, eu tô vendendo, I'm selling cakes on campus. Um, I'm selling cake on campus. This reduction of the to is what is used for estou, but in Brazilian spoken Portuguese and also in Portuguese in general, to is much more common than sto. So we, if I would create this dialogue myself without having, you know, this happening more naturally, I would probably not do that, right? Or the reduction here on thank you, she doesn't say obrigada, she just says brigada, which is something that you hear a lot in Brazil. And here you have two different students saying brigada, brigada and also the reduction for happy gene. Uh, in this case, it's like really fast, but, um, and this dialogue, you know, it is a work in progress. This whole book is a work in progress because we, we are still putting things together, but I can show you, let me see if I have the dialogue on my screen here. And you see that it's not. Nossa amiga. Oi, boa tarde, tudo bom? Oi, boa tarde. É, eu tô vendendo bolo aqui no campus hoje. Vocês têm, têm interesse? É bolo do quê? É bolo de chocolate com banana vegano. Ah, obrigada. Eu não gosto de banana. Eu quero um. Quanto custa? Três reais. Ok, I'm gonna start this one here because I will continue. Muito obrigada. Nossa amiga. Obrigada. Oi, boa tarde, tudo bom? Oi, boa tarde. É, eu tô vendendo bolo aqui no campus hoje. Vocês têm. So this person was actually selling a piece of cake on campus to to make more money for herself. She's a student, uh, you know, to make ends meet. So we took that opportunity, talked to them, and she agreed to do the recording. And as you see, it's not a very extremely professional recording, but But the main idea is that the language is there, right? The, the language production is there. And I could keep talking on and on about the material, but I think I'll turn to Carlos and I'll give more time at the end for questions, right? So uh, I think that's about my 10 minutes there. Oh, I should stop sharing screen, screen right, Carlos. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to talk about um, five premises um, and six concrete pedagogical uh, strategies to think about when uh, creating a, a, a course design, when creating a class, teaching a class, and creating a syllabus. 
Um, so uh, the five the five premises uh, do not make assumptions about students, um, especially in faculty meetings or in, for instance, I often see that my my colleagues do not want to address diversity or inclusion, uh, inclusivity issues in the meetings, but uh, because they do not know, they're not familiar with the vocabulary. Like for instance, when teaching Spanish or Portuguese, uh, sh how should I address, how should I use neutral pronouns? But I don't want to deal with this because it makes me uncomfortable. So, but it's not about them, it's about the students they're teaching to. Um, so in this attitude, it's a form of denial. Right? Um, I see, uh, second, I see a lot of instructors and coordinators and professors uh, theorizing about on how to teach a class um, and then how to organize goals, break down a lesson plan, gather content for a class, but then they fail to establish a connection between the classroom and the outside of it. Right? What happens in the, in the world, so the social events, and um, what's happening outside the classroom. And establishing a connection between the, the class and the, uh, and the community. One can be prepared for whatever, one can, one can have years of experience, but without uh, uh, thinking uh, and bringing real life situations into, into the classroom, um, that, uh, and without using diversity and inclusion uh, tools, the class will, have, uh, will be a huge fail. Three, we can take graduate grad seminars uh, on how to teach a class, build a career out of it uh, as an educator, or even teach a class, but without inclusion and diversity in the classroom, or and even acknowledging social differences um, and challenges between social groups, different uh, social groups, the class and that syllabus live in real denial because they are portraying something which does not exist. Um, students and professors need to get themselves educated, all of us. Uh, and they have to give center stage to all the voices which have been silenced throughout the centuries. Um, this, um, this, of course, culminated with the last, with the recent uh, George Floyd protests. People are sick of the same standard narrative. Finally, you have to decentralize yourself in order to understand these multiple narratives. Um, talking about concrete strategies, uh, I'm going to share my screen and I want to show this, okay? Okay, so uh, uh, six, six concrete strategies uh, to think about um, diversity and inclusion in the classroom. Uh, the first one, learn basic vocabulary, which is related to a specific community. For instance, words for the color of the skin versus the color of the object, which is a huge thing in Portuguese language. Uh, the, the difference between, uh, like in English, the N word and, the, and black. Um, we have the same thing in, in Portuguese. Usually in the Portuguese textbooks, this difference is, is um, put in a small um, curiosity rectangle like a like footnote, and it's like in Portuguese, usually say negro for people and put it for, um, put it for objects, but it's not always like that. So we have to ad address those differences. Um, B, words for important traditions, holidays, institutions. Uh, for instance, um, uh, I, uh, I thought about when talking about institutions, I thought about the uh, uh, Instituto da Mulher Negra in Portugal, which is a recent one. Also, the uh, so which which is the Institute for the Black Woman in Portugal, Association for Development of um, Romani Portuguese Women or Gypsy Portuguese Women. Uh, gypsy is a very loose word, so I replace it by uh, for Romani, which is more. Uh, uh, in community proper. And then, for instance, Angola's first LGBT association, Association Irish. Also, um, for instance, get to know uh, or practice gender neutral pronouns in Portuguese uh, for queer non confirming and trans, and trans uh, um, communities. Um, second one, uh, avoid, as I've said before, avoid making assumptions about students and there's an, uh, an, a missing end. And create a safe environment. One of the things that I always do in a literature class, culture, cinema, or language class that I do in the beginning, first class, right before I, I have in the syllabus, is a small uh, form, a small sheet, in which we have welcome to the Portuguese class, 
uh, what is your name? What do you study? What are some of your interests? Why are you studying Portuguese? Which name and pronouns should be used when I am addressing to you? This is the most important one. And would you like to add any um, additional information about yourself? This allows the students to choose the words for themselves instead of us thinking that if someone identifies as that or something else. Um, number three. Become familiar with support, um, with support services of interest to students within your own community, with our you know, schools and universities, and establish connections between the content of your class and the students' communities, uh, for instance, uh, around them. In the case at the University of Pennsylvania, I thought about the Casa Latina for the Latinx students, Muslim Students Association, Black Alumni Society, Indigenous Students Association, LGBTQ Center, etc. Number four, um, when, it comes to, when it comes to the scribes, one's physical and physical, physiological traits, I do, not correct, I do not correct the gender agreement in the classroom, in Portuguese, or in the homework, so that I do not make assumptions about the student's sexual or gender identities. I do, however, make sure that the students understand that in Portuguese, since Portuguese is a Roman language, uh, uh, language and it's, uh, and it's um, a highly gendered uh, language, uh, so it traditionally has two markers for the binary gender, O for masculine and A for feminine, and that in a more traditional environment, like a professional environment, those two forms are accepted as the norm. But of course, we want to abolish the norm. So I let the students choose from either binary forms, masculine or feminine, or gender non-conforming pronouns, just the ones like Eduardo said before, using among others like the X, like in Latin X, or the E, which is more neutral, like menin or touch. I only correct the gender agreement for inanimate objects. For instance, for instance, carro amarelo, because carro is an object, so it has to make the, uh, the gender uh, agreement has to be established, uh, versus carro amarela. This is just some thoughts about it. Uh, number five, activities, uh, concrete activities. I think that students need to have, all of us need to have uh, historic references, historical figures to whom we relate to. For instance, number five, I always create this event which is the month of the Afro-Lusophone history based on the, on the Black History Month in the, um, in, 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 in the United States. It's very important and it's not very often um, celebrated in Portugal um, or Brazil or, or um, Africa. For instance, we have, this is just a small array of people, like for instance, Paulo Xizian, Paulina Xizian, I apologize, from, there's a mistake, I apologize, Paulina Xizian from Mozambique, not from Guinea-Bissau, she's, a, po she's a, a poet. Then we have Sonia Guajajara and Raoni below their indigenous um, activists. We have Mama Duba from Senegal and Portugal. He's a, he's, a, he's a head of the SOS racist movement in Portugal. We have Janine Escobar. She's a, she's, uh, she's a head of the um, black feminism thought in Portugal. We have, for instance, Olga Mariano. Olga Mariano below is a head of the um, movement of the uh, Romani Portuguese Woman Association or Gypsy Woman. We have Rico Dalassam, which is a queer rapper from Brazil. We have Sueli Carneiro. She's the head of the uh, movement of the Afro-Caribbean uh, uh, um, um, uh, women's movement. And then, for instance, another one, like for instance, we have Sueli Carneiro. Sueli Carneiro is a footballer from, uh, a soccer player from Portugal and uh, Guinea-Bissau, is Muslim. Um, we have like more historical references, Amigo Cabral, who fought for the independence of Guinea-Bissau and Cabo Verde. And then, for instance, Alex Simões, a, 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 a queer poet from Bahia in Brazil. Uh, for instance, one, one, one simple activity, choose from one of these characters and, do a and prepare a presentation, uh, uh, an English presentation. Who, who are these people, who are these people? Um, why do you think they're important for the culture of their countries? Uh, do you relate to any of them? Why? And are there any other characters like these ones in your own country? Finally, this is my final uh, activity, which is uh, when talking about physical description or uh, psychological description, this is usually in the first, in the first part of the, the first half of the first semester of a Portuguese or the first, first year uh, curriculum. Uh, usually people choose 
uh, very normative websites and then ask students to describe themselves. So we kind of open the borders and we went to Tinder, Grindr, Happen, OkCupid, Black, Meet, Black People Meet, My Crush, Her, The Lesbian App, or Chappy. All of these are different. Uh, usually, and this, this happens very often at faculty meetings, my colleagues are like, I don't want to deal with this because, I mean, it looks like my students want just, they want to hook up. And it's like, well, I don't care. I just want them to get to Brazil, get to Rio de Janeiro, get to Sao Paulo, and establish connections with their own community. What, the way that you use the, 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 the app is something else and it's personal, but I want you to set your own profile. Uh, so for instance, you get to a new Lusophone country and you want to uh, meet new people, choose an app and set a profile. Talking about uh, physical uh, um, traits, uh, psychological um, uh, features, likes, what are you studying and what kind of person are you looking for? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Eduardo and Carlos. I have to say, if, I, if this was around when I was in high school, I probably would have approached Portuguese a little bit differently. Um, <laughs> I know, because everything changes. I mean, every, every five, 10 years, everything changes so much, right? Four years of Portuguese, and it was nothing like this. So um, my first question is more of a global question to kind of make us think about the diversity and the different perspectives within the Lusophone or the Portuguese speaking world. Um, and just to clarify for the audience here, you know, we have uh, countries in South America, Europe, Africa, and also Southeast Asia, if you think about, let's say, Macau and East Timor. And sometimes we forget about North America. Like I, I was talking to a colleague in the University of Toronto who's Portuguese American, uh, immigrated here like I did. And there's different perspectives. So my question to you all is this. What was the process to incorporate all these different perspectives and language uh, in putting this all together? Would you please repeat the last sentence because there was a cut on the, on the connection. Sure, sure, sure. What was your process to incorporate all these different perspectives sure. into the project? I can, I can say that recording people in Brazil and having them producing the dialogues about topics, it was an important part. So we didn't come up with dialogues ourselves for at least for the half, first half part of the book when you know, now with the pandemic, you're not going to Brazil, but uh, that was one. Listening to students as well, students in our classes and students in Brazil and doing a kind of work that's, you know, doesn't belong just to people from my generation because, you know, most of the students that we teach are very young, like 18, 19 years old, I would say between anywhere between 18 and 22 at the university, right? Um, and for that group of students, the way that they connect socially and the way that they see their gender and sexuality, it's much more fluid than people of my age, um, in my case, in their 40s. So listening to them is important. And, and it, it's a learning process too, because we are learning, right? And I think what's happening now in the US and with the George Floyd um, and the uh, Black Lives Matter in Brazil, Vidas Pretas in Porto, um, it's showing us that, you know, culture is changing uh, and so should our textbooks. So listening to students and learning from them uh, as more, as, you know, it can sound like a cliche, but I think it's really important. And I can give a concrete example about that. I had the TA, uh, we had an activity in the textbook that was about hair and about black hair. And we recorded a video in Brazil with a blonde a white girl commenting on a girl's black hair, saying that was beautiful. And I thought it was a great video. I'm like, this is great, you know, it works really well. Then the TA that works with me said, well, that falls into that you know premise that the white person is the one now commenting on a black hair and and that can be problematic right so um but it's not something that i saw myself so i needed someone to point out to me and then rethink and go like okay i want to talk about black hair but maybe there is another way of doing this right instead of 
having a white person defining uh, what is beauty or not in black bodies. Let's have, you know, black people doing it or not, right? Um, so that's one example. Well, another thing, Carlos, that I was thinking about is, um, I mean, in a classroom, it's impossible for you to know about everything. So you are, I mean, you are, you are a mediator. In order to be a mediator, you, as, you have to ask other people, what are their customs and usages? So that's what we did. Instead of, for instance, with the Romani people, commonly known as gypsies, um, in Portugal or in Brazil, it's, there's a lot of preconceived ideas. So I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I went directly uh, to the uh, the gypsy to the Romani communities in Portugal and asked them, for instance, about words, about, for instance, the uh, physical description of the hair, uh, color skin, how do you identify yourself, so that I do not make those assumptions or I do not reproduce them myself. Okay. Um, so let me ask. In both Eduardo and Carlos, you, you actually answered my next question, which I was going to be asking around sort of um, uh, how do you include all these voices from the minority communities into the textbook, which you did a great job explaining. So yeah, you're actually uh, answering a lot of the questions, which is really good. Um, my other question that I have is um, how do you reconcile what is written in the Portuguese language? Like, for example, a Portuguese newspaper to, you know, a novel. How do you reconcile what's been written and the inclusivity piece that you all are talking about. Oh, how yeah. Do you uh, yes, that's that's always a good exercise. For instance, how do you, for instance, for that, uh, using the exercise of propaganda, how uh, does the Portuguese advertisement propaganda in Brazil uh, in the 70s or um, 20th century Portugal, how do, so I want students to understand the way that Portugal and Brazil saw themselves through propaganda, because I want them to question that. Even today, when we talk about the statues, the thing about the statues, how do we, I mean, it, it's like, how do we see each other through the statues? I'm not talking about judgments. It's not, it's not so much if it's right or wrong, but it's like, how do we locate ourselves ahead of this kind of advertisement throughout the centuries? Even, for instance, uh, one of the, I don't know, one of the good exercises, it's like, uh, if you, for the students, have you seen that all of these pieces of input, either newspaper, TV, TV shows, etc., are usually explained by one kind of person? What about we go there and ask the person that you're talking about what they think about themselves? Okay. Uh, with the literature, I think introducing black writers and indigenous writers uh, is important. Um, you know, we have to be intentional. And that's not to say that, you know, all of the great, you know, Fernando Pessoa and, and Guimarães Rosa should not be represented. You know, they, of course they should be represented. But uh, we should also include black writers. We should include, you know, someone like Conceição Evaristo, who is a novel writer from Brazil. A very prominent, or Paulina Chiziani from Mozambique. And since this textbook that we are talking about is just an introduction, it's just the first year of content for a language class, we had like, there is one lesson that we have, we are talking about biographies, and you have, uh, you know, a little bit of a biography, a mini biography of Conceição Evaristo, side by side with Paulina Chiziani, and I think that helps the students just to see a little bit more of, you know, other writers that are not necessarily represented in textbooks. Um, and this is part of the lesson, right? It's not just a side comment. It's really an integral part of the lesson. Um, I just wanted to back up a little bit, uh, Carlos, if that's okay. I was thinking that even though we are talking here about a textbook that is an introduction for Portuguese. It's the first year textbook for beginners. You can see how much we can do in terms of diversity, right? And how problematic some of the chapters can be. If you take a chapter on description of body, right? Uh, and hair and skin color and, and race, 
this can be very, very difficult and problematic and it's something we should discuss and, and have an open conversation about it. And I do think that, again, you know, going back to the students, there are times that they might notice something that we don't and then we should listen to them. You know, it's time to listen, um, especially those of us who are white and, and deal with, and sometimes don't even know how to deal with, um, are afraid of saying anything, right? Because they're like, well, I don't know how to deal with other races. Uh, and we should think about our own whiteness and start learning a little bit and reading. And, and that's something I have been doing. I have been reading black writers and, and try to understand more and be more thoughtful of what I'm doing. So I want to switch a little bit because I looked at our audience and I wanted to make sure that we can canvas different types of interest. So we kind of talked about sort of the, the, the kind of in-house, what you do in-house as an academic, but let's switch it a little bit. Um, many of us have seen job postings for, you know, whatever position, but they're looking for someone who's bicultural, or not necessarily bicultural, but bilingual in Portuguese and English, right? Okay. So, which is a great thing. And, I, and I'm, much, I'm actually thinking about this from folks who are on this webinar from Massachusetts or from other places where there's a high density of Portuguese speakers. My question is, is how do you take the lessons learned of what you're doing here? And how does that kind of inform the field for once the students leave your classroom and actually are going to be hired and they're asking for someone to be uh, as Portuguese, you know, bilingual. Have you thought about that? Or just, are you beginning to think about that? I'm just kind of curious. I mean, on my behalf, I think about that every once a year. Uh, it's a constant, uh, thing in my mind because um, every, um, so at Penn we were run on semesters. So every full semester I teach the Portuguese for the professions uh, class. So I prepare the students for, um, to go out on the job market. For instance, I don't know if they get a job in New York at a, I don't know, at a company and they have to uh, speak Spanish, Portuguese and or English, or then they usually go, um, to, to, they're going to graduate and they're going to Brazil or, or Lisbon or Portugal. Um, how do I incorporate that? And for instance, how, usually the professional world tends to be very conservative. So it's kind of a fight uh, to understand diversity within the classroom, but then how do you take it outside? Uh, especially because some of the students, when they come back, or if I see them later, they are like, uh, well, the interview did not, did not go that well because they started to tell me off. I mean, not tell me off, but they started to criticize my diversity kind of language in the curriculum. And it's like, but that's, I mean, that's, that's a struggle, that's a challenge. I find where I am located, I'm, at, in, I'm in Seattle, teaching at the University of Washington. Seattle is a very progressive city. So my feeling is that most of the students in the classroom are way ahead of me when it comes to issues of race and, and sexuality and gender. Um, and the fact that a lot of our students are Spanish speakers, which seems to be, um, pretty regular thing in a lot of classes, I would say. Portuguese classes, we have Spanish speakers, sometimes half of the class. Um, most of them, at least in my experience, come from minority groups. So they have experienced racism and they have experienced um, white fragility and you know uh, other issues their whole lives. And, and they have a very clear understanding, I think, of the situation. So when it comes to the job market and looking for a job and presenting yourself, um, you know, I think those students are ahead of the game already. But that said, you know, that's not true for everybody. I don't think so. And uh, students who are uh, in, in these classrooms that have mixed race classes, you know, they learn from each other as well. If you have a framework that allows that, right? That allows the students to uh, voice their identities, talk about their, uh, you know, how they see themselves, how they negotiate their identities. Uh, I think that's important. 
And in my case, we do an exchange with Brazilian students online, and that helps a lot too, because you are then talking directly with someone that's living in another country that speaks the language you're learning, um, and that's going through different experiences than, than the students here are. And that negotiation and that talk, uh, um, I think it's very productive. So this is the last question before we turn it over to the Q&A portion of this webinar. And I'm hoping that this moderated um, discussion, uh, discussion and also the presentation is going to stimulate a lot of these questions for the Q&A. So we cannot forget about our high school teachers. Not, we cannot forget about them. So if I'm a high school teacher, right, and I want to incorporate some of these activities into my classroom, how do I do that? Now, keep in mind that the present dialogue that's going on now, we're going to go on, uh, you know, online or maybe hybrid, whatever the case is for the fall. So is there an advantage for if I was a high school Portuguese teacher to use some of this, let's say for the fall or pilot? I'm just kind of curious. What are your thoughts? Do you want to talk, Carlos, P, or should I? Um, I think that, you know, we created this material for university students, but we put in the introduction that it can be used with uh, other age groups as well, and, and high school students or middle school students. It just has to be adapted. So uh, not, you know, all exercise in the textbook would work with high school students. But a lot of them would, you know, a lot of uh, active uh, chapters would work really well with high school students. And since it's an open source, uh, a teacher can just pick and choose what goes well with his or her class and can also change, right? Can, can download the textbook um, and, and change the, the activities as it goes. So I think in that sense, it can work well. Do you have any thoughts, Carlos, before we switch to Q&A? Uh, no, I mean, it's the same. The same, the same. Okay. I think it's, it's a way of uh, which kind of materials do you choose? And right. if you want to portray real life and not portray the canon, uh, you have to shake it and you have to change it. And especially oh. because it's exactly what Edward said. The, 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 I mean, the students are way ahead of us. Uh, some of them are so fluid that they, they can see, I mean, they do not consider these as principles because, you know, it's just the university sometimes is very conservative and sets a lot of rules, even with language and literature. So it's like they don't even care. Yeah, so don't, it's much more beautiful than that. I don't think our textbook is very edgy for students. It's just normal thing for them. But it's like, for teachers, yes, it's something yes. a little yes. bit Maybe it's, the new, it's their normal, the new normal. Too. And just one thing to, to be said, you know, students who are taking a lot of Portuguese classes at the university level, uh, many of them just came from high school. So they are adapting, they are in a transition mode. You know, that's their first year at the university, they are getting to know themselves in a different setting, we, we all know how that goes, but it's not that different, you know, it's not like the person completely changed their personality the day they, they entered the university. I mean, they are transitioning from high school. So in some ways, you know, the high school students, the senior students, they are kind of our students as well, right? So I don't see a complete disconnect between high school and university, uh, as sometimes we talk as two completely different things when you know i've seen a lot of work that's done by uh, and i would even argue that that a lot of the work that's done by instructors at teachers at the high school level middle school level it's pretty impressive you know the amount of time and effort that put into their classes uh, i would think that it goes and you know i can be criticized by saying that but it goes beyond what most university teachers do in a language class, uh, especially if you get, you know, someone that's a TA and has a full load of teaching, of taking classes, right, as a graduate student and is also teaching a language class, that person doesn't always have the time or maybe not even invested in the language class 
as most, I would say, of the high school, middle school teachers are. So um, just a comment, side comment. Nope. I want to say thank you both to Eduardo and Carlos um, for your wonderful presentation, but also the, for the wonderful stimulating conversation. Right now, folks, this is your time. We're going to turn it over to Q&A, and I see uh, in my left-hand side there's tons of questions, and I'm going to turn it over to Leslie. Hi. Um, so we are, uh, if you could put any questions you may have in the chat box, we're trying to organize it this way. So I'm posing the first question that we received, and that is, in what, in which countries did you collect materials for the book so far, audio and video? And where do you plan to go to collect more material? If I could piggyback on that, maybe also, how did you collect it? What, what, um, how, how did you go about doing that? So because we we follow a communicative approach in class, so it's usually set by the, the, the input, which is the most important uh, part in the class. It's, it's a short, meaning, meaningful real-life situation, then uh, followed by a, 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 small, a small activity, and then communicative, communicative activities to uh, use everything uh, that we've learned uh, that day. Uh, for that, we had to record real people, and uh, so we went to, to create that uh, meaningful and real life uh, input. We went to Brazil, we, went, we uh, recorded some videos in um, Araraquara, in the state of Sao Paulo, and then in, at the um, Federal University of Belo Horizonte, in, um, of Minas Gerais, in Belo Horizonte. And then I also went to Guinea Bissau, in Bissau, and did the same thing. Um, and we plan on going to Angola and Mozambique too, in Portugal. Uh, but everything, I mean, got stuck because of COVID. <laughs> yeah, I would say that for the recordings, um, because right now we just have the Brazilian version of the textbook out and Carlos is working on an European uh, version of it. Um, and for the recordings we got so far different regions of Brazil with students that are students at the University of Washington as well. Uh, so we try to do a little bit of what would be almost in, um, an audio book in some sense that you can listen to the directions of an exercise you can listen to the lists. So there are students from the northeast of Brazil, from Salvador, Recife in Olinda, and a student from Mato Grosso. And I recorded some things, I'm from the south of Brazil. And so far we haven't got anybody from Sao Paulo and Rio yet, but uh, I wanna make sure I, I get that, you know, because it's very important as well. And Rio is like, specific accent that it should be there. Uh, I would like to see uh, recordings from people from Mozambique and Angola, as Carlos said, and from you know, a range of places. Because even though the, the student experience and the way that they speak Portuguese is shaped by the way that their teachers speak Portuguese, right? Uh, if you have a teacher from Portugal, that's how you're gonna speak Portuguese. But even though that's how it is, we want to make sure that we have a range of accents in the textbook. So when someone talks to you from a different country, it's like you never heard that variation of the language, right? Uh, just like I could, you know, listen to someone from London and Australia, have some difficulties, especially with the Australian, but I would understand most of it. Uh, I, we want to expose the students to that. So. Okay, our next question comes from um, an English as a foreign language instructor. And she asks, when teaching English as a foreign language, how would you suggest using inclusivity in regards to using the first language in the classroom, more specifically related to the power dynamics created by colonialism? Hmm. Um, I think in terms of materials in English, um, the teaching of English as a second language is way, way more ahead than the Portuguese um, uh, materials. I, uh, I see that throughout the world that people, when it comes to Portuguese, do not address the color and ethnicity issues 
uh, what it, does it mean to be dark haired, moreno, uh, negro, even what, what, what does it mean to use the, the, the prit word in, in Portuguese, which is black, but between uh, two uh, black people. There's a lot of connotations, uh, but people do not want to touch that. Uh, also, I can give two other examples. Um, the use of word, uh, the word of panleiro in Portugal and viado in Brazil, which is commonly known as uh, faggot. Uh, and sometimes my queer students want to know the word for faggot because they want to use them in, they want to use it within their own community. Um, just like the N word in the black communities. So, um, and I think that in the, in the, in the, in the English uh, language world is, have the materials have been so so inclusive and diverse for the I don't for, for a long time. Um, even I don't know. Uh, two concrete examples are the usage of word P in in England for the Pakistanis people, uh, and people say like Paki 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 in the UK is, is a slur. Or for instance, the word for the slur for Chinese in Portugal, which is which is Shinoka, which is totally a slur, but people use it because ah, they think it's funny. They, the Chinese people, and it's not funny. So uh, I think in Portuguese, we need to shake a lot of this and have the, the, the conversations that uh, the, the English second, second, uh, second language materials have been having for the past 20 years. Carlos, I just want to add on the use of first language in the classroom in the ESL context. I had some experience uh, teaching English as a, an additional language. I did that for about four years. And in my experience, I noticed like kind of a clear divide of some people that some teachers, ESL teachers that were really against the use of the first language in the classroom. And I understand, you know, if you open the door that, you know, students are speaking, that was in the Canadian context, that was in Vancouver. So, you know, we had a class with uh, students from China, from South Korea, from um, South Arabia, South Ar right, and, and other areas. So, and I've seen some teachers in what I would describe as a racist attitude as well, that they would get so angry. There was an anger that was very tense, right? If a student would speak their language. And and I think some of it comes from our approach to teaching as well. I do think there is a space for your first language in the classroom, I do, especially in the lower levels. Uh, I, and that's what I used to teach when a student was completely lost, you know, in a, in a class and they needed some help and, and a friend would help them. I never saw that as a threat, right? I never saw that as uh, it's something against my, my teaching quite the opposite, you know, it helped the student to move along a little bit instead of being stuck for like 10 minutes without knowing what's happening uh, because they obviously have different levels, right? In, in like our, all of our classes, not everybody's on the same uh, proficiency level. Um, and in terms of the decolonizing the classroom, I think that's an exercise that we should do as teachers uh, we should think about our, ourselves, where do you come from, right? Um, and do that exercise of writing down uh, where do we live, who used to live here before. So, you know, if I do that in Brazil and I think where I, I used to live and who was living there before, it was indigenous peoples, right? That were uh, part of a genocide, right? So. And, and I come from European, European descendants and some Africans, but mostly Europeans. Um, so thinking of that, you know, where we, are from, where we are from and where we are living, and I think it's an important exercise of decolonization. But yeah, I do see the, the, use of, the use of first language in the classroom as something that we should be more open to. Uh, I don't think our teaching pedagogy, you know, practices, sometimes they're very much against it, 100%. And it's not taking into consideration what's mentioned in this question in terms of colonialism and the colonization of the classrooms. It's just thought of the linguistic point of view, right?
Thank you, Eduardo. That was a that was wonderful. Um, this has been a wonderful presentation, um, and um, I want to thank everyone for being able to attend and join us today. Um, I'm going to pass the mic to Leslie Marsh, Director of Center um, for Latin American and Latinx Studies, um, who's going to give some closing remarks. But if you want to stay, I know there are several more questions in yeah. the in the chat box. So if you want to stay for five or five or so more minutes, um, I'll just let Leslie close out the session and people who need to leave, um, we respect your time and we'll see you again soon. Yeah, I'm happy to talk to people and I think Carlos as well, right Carlos? Great. Uh, well, thank you so much to uh, Eduardo Viana and to Carlos Pio for sharing your reflections on the development of your book. Thank you to Ines for helping out to coordinating and uh, inviting our speakers and to Carlos Pavon for being the moderator today. Um, I also thank everyone who's attended our, our discussion as well. I think that um, uh, Carlos opened up the discussion with a very good point that language uh, intersects so closely with uh, cultural competence and identity and global citizenship and it's something that we need to keep it in, 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 at the forefront of our work. And I, uh, it was good to hear the suggestions provided by Eduardo and Carlos, some very practical suggestions. And these are simple changes that we can make when we're teaching language that can make a huge difference um, from allow, by highlighting the feminine form before the masculine form, for allowing using X and uh, other forms that are used in a popular way that have been um, downgraded. So historically when we're teaching grammar as if there's just one correct way to teach it. And also looking for other sources of hi historic references and people who uh, we need to include in the discussion. I appreciated the fact that you reminded us to not make assumptions about our students and the, uh, the importance of establishing connections with the outside world, which is key. But also to make sure that we're aware of where we are at, who we are, and to not place ourselves in the center of uh, the courses that we teach and to allow some of the voices that have been historically silenced to, to, be, the, the, to be on stage more. Um, so thank you again for sharing uh, your insights and tips, your suggestions, and providing a model for us to, to, to contribute to, to work with. And I uh, look forward to the discussion that will follow. Uh, both Eduardo and Carlos, I just want to say one quick thing. I just want to thank you, um, more from a native speaker perspective, to really incorporate the queer, critical race, and the feminist dialogues into our language which is something I rarely see, are only segregated in the literature as a different type of genre that you know sometimes we go to to look explore different things. And I think that's really important to look at different perspectives. So this is not just for those who want to learn Portuguese or those who are interested in the language of Portuguese, but also native speakers, we need to grow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And we are happy to continue the conversation with whoever wants questions, to. Yes. yes, actually, I wanted to say something. One of the questions is, uh, because I've been, uh, yes, so Morena Santana says uh, that uh, many things change. My question is, are you planning to update this material at some point? Yes, we do, because everything changes, especially after every, every academic year, everything changes, society changes, and now more than ever, and I guess in the first time in the history of mankind, people are free to do so. Sometimes it's hard to do because there's a lot of politics and um, social constrictions and prejudices, but we can, I mean, we can do it which is, I mean, the ability to do it, it's already a huge fight. And uh, especially what's going on with, with, you know, with the, with the, it started with the protests of George Floyd that triggered a whole new discussion in changing deeply the curriculum at the university level and at the high school level, the curriculum. I mean, things have to be changed. Do you wanna, as a suggestion, Leslie, since, you know, the, the section is officially over, do you want people who ask the questions to go on sequence and maybe take their mic off and then they can ask their own question? And that way you could interact a little bit? Yeah, that's, that, that sounds fine to me, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I like the interaction more than- Yeah, absolutely. So maybe 
I don't know who the next person is, but uh, uh, let's see. Camilla, if Camila is here. I think Nic Nicholas Frank is uh, Nicholas Frank still here? Yes, I see. Nicholas Frank, would would you like to? Oh, whoever wants to talk. Right? Or anyone else? Yeah. Anyone else wants to talk? I can ask a question. Yeah. Who's that? Denise. Oh, oi, Denise. Hi, oi. Um, muito obrigada de novo. Uh, my question had to do with what advantages do you see your textbook, both the format and the material? Uh, having in response to this push for online distance learning due to COVID-19. And I say that because sometimes, you know, when we're in the classroom, um, the, the topics of uh, diversity and inclusion tend to be facilitated more dynamically. And I think now we're facing a situation where the majority of our universities or uh, high school campuses are going to be online. And so uh, it's still important not to lose that, that human connection, that opportunity for uh, promoting discussion. So just any thoughts on, on where you see um, the material in the textbook facilitating that? Uh, I, briefly, I wanted to say that the first week of March, no, the second week of, uh, second week, uh, weekend of March, when Penn decided to do everything online because of the COVID situation, one of the challenges was the fact that many students had forgotten their books, the physical books, in the dorms, in a different city, because everyone had already left Philadelphia. So I had to change everything, and those changes will be incorporated in the next, uh, like in the late August, in the beginning of the uh, new semester. So that was quite a challenge. Eduardo? I've been using this textbook of the first year classes with more supplemental material since 2018. I started in the summer of 2018 using the material. So I used to copy them and give to students because I wanted them to have the physical textbook, right? But now that things are online, it's so much easier in that sense, like in you no know, terms of just the logistics, right? I just say, here it is, that's the link. We all look at it, it's very easy to, to do it. Uh, there is no restriction, you just go to the link and that's it. And the, the workbook activities are built into the, the Canvas system, which this summer I hope, hopefully I'll be able to put it online on a Creative Commons on Canvas and at some point on Blackboard as well in Moodle, that's the idea. So everybody has access to the workbook. Um, but what you're saying about the connections, I find that there are so many people in Brazil now, and I'm talking about Brazil because that's where I have the closest connection to, that they are thirsty for connections with people here. They want to learn about what's happening. They want to learn about uh, you know, li life here in general. And, and if you can establish any kind of connection using a platform like this, it just makes the class so much more interesting, I would say. So what I'm doing is that four times per quarter or five times per quarter, we do an online exchange on Zoom and I separate students on breakout rooms one-on-one -on -one, and they talk for 25 minutes in Portuguese, 25 minutes in English. Uh, the first two interactions, they get to know each other and the like third and fourth interaction, we suggest them some topics, you know, like you can watch this movie like Bacurau and you can talk about it, or you can watch this movie in English, this movie in Portuguese, or this part of a mini series, right, and talk about it. Um, and I find that has been the highlight of the classes. Um, you know, the textbook has limits. And, uh, and I think, yeah, I think that has been the highlight of my classes, at least the, the Zoom interaction. We started in, in March. Uh, it was last quarter, it was in April, I think. Thank you. You're welcome. Sure, Anybody else? Um, I'm going to go ahead and read uh, Nicholas's uh, question. She asked for me to read it. She said, I really love the integration of real people into your lessons to provide faces to the content. What other realistic cultural aspects do you try to represent in your lessons? 
Uh, one of the things that I did, for instance, in Portugal with the, um, with the Gypsy, with the Romani community is, um, so I researched and there was this pedagogical kit prepared by the, um, by the, uh, by the uh, uh, Gypsy Women uh, Association. Uh, and it's a kit, it is a kit prepared for the teaching of Gypsy culture at the high school level in Portugal. Uh, it's a small kit, but it was really helpful because it was real. So it was not so much me talking about the way that they dress. Do you know when everyone wants to do a summer gypsy wedding and it's all about the long sleeves and it's like, I mean, a culture, it's not about the long sleeves, there's so much in that. So the pedagogical kit was really helpful. It was given to me by the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the National Observatory of the Gypsy Culture in Portugal and included uh, and these are real materials included a small so a small um, a small sample of traditional short stories uh, told by gypsy people uh, that talk about the history of the, of the of the of the community then a short this is really helpful for the students uh, a short um, um, Voc group of words for, I mean, everyday words for, for instance, of the uh, Roman, uh, Romanon um, language. For instance, for the hair, how to use for hair, the kind of hair, face, eyes, hands, color of the skin, uh, um, some fruits, some food, etc. And then two more. The other one is a choreography, as an example, of a rumba um, portrayed from a gypsy point of view. And then curiosities in terms of clothing, traditions, and food. And the culmination is the celebration, for instance, which is great for a uh, um, uh, cultural exercise, for the, uh, the National Day of the Gypsy Person in Brazil, which, is, which was actually in Brazil, was um, established by the President Lula, um, and in Portugal. So that's the kind of real material that for instance, we've been using. Eduardo, if you want to add something. You know, I think a lot of times textbooks, they tend to represent culture from the point of view of the author. So even when you try to represent someone that lives in a favela, for instance, in a shanty town, it's really hard because you don't know what that life is, right? So, um, and I do think we tend to whitewash a lot of the, the things or to, it's so easy to fall into stereotypes and, and that's why it, it's key to talk to people who live in that situation. That does not mean they can be the spokesperson for everybody that live in a favela, let's say, right? That's another, that can be problematic too. So, I mean, everything is very much more complex than a textbook can, can put it. So, um, as people who are thinking of this constantly, like all of us, right? Um, one thing we did is to create this part of cultural practice when you know we describe the cultural practice without judging without saying anything so one of them was selling you know a piece of cake at the university right that was a cultural practice and then we asked the students to compare that to their own experiences so people would say yes we sell donuts on campus right the students in my class but that's different we don't make the donuts we don't need that dollar to pay our rent at the, end of, at the end of the year, at the end of the month. So they understand that it's coming from a different life experience. And I think that's key, right? To understand that there are people in Brazil who are students like them, like they are, that they actually go through this, right? They are making, baking a cake at home, thinking, okay, I'm gonna make 10 reais or 20 reais out of this cake, right? Um, I think that's important. And at the same time, it's important not to think that we are the ones that are looking at this and going like, oh, these poor people in Brazil that, you know, we, sh we are trying to save them. Well, not really, right? Uh, they have a lot of self-initiative. They, they have a lot of things going on too. So it's just, we can fall into traps very easily. I'll just say that it's so easy to fall into traps but to be critical about it and to make students ask questions, I think it's more important than having answers for everything. 
uh, because there are not answers for everything. I think that is the last question. Does anyone yeah. else have any questions? I, I see a lot of compliments and a lot of thanks. Um, I think we all appreciate the work that you're doing and we can all learn from it. Um, so I'm just gonna say thank you again for joining us. Um, Leslie, Carlos, Inez, do you have anything else to say? Yes, thank you so much for all of you for the, uh, this great opportunity. I wanted, to say, I wanted to say one thing, Diana. If anybody wants to contribute with the material, and we'll make sure you put you as a collaborator, or if you write a text about a cultural practice, we, we'll make sure we put your name on, under the text as the author. Of course, you just have to authorize, right? There is like a, a release form that have to sign authorizing us to use it. Um, there is no you know, financial compensation involved. Obviously, this was not, you know, something that neither Carlos and I made any money on it. But if anyone here who are teachers and want to see uh, a group of people being represented in a textbook, and if you want, you know, a colleague that you have in Brazil to write something about that group of people or about a cultural practice, or to give a picture that you want to see on a textbook. Uh, we are very open to this, not open, it would be great, right? Because it will make the material more rich. I'm going to write my email here. Carlos, you could do the same. Okay. I have a chat. So feel free to email me, right? Um, and I'll be very happy to see where we can put the material. Because the textbook's not completely done. It's, it is, a little bit of a cliche to say that's a work in progress, but it is, right? It's gonna take, we're never gonna be done. <laughs> You're gonna just keep adding things and, and changing things. So. I apologize, would you please write your email? Because we didn't- Mine is there. Oh, it went privately ah, okay. to everyone. And, and we'll send out a, a, in, um, an email to everybody who participated today. Um, to get your feedback and if you want to stay in touch, um, we'll give you our email addresses and we'd love to hear from you. And Carlos, could we mention our other project with the texts? Carlos Pio? No, I did not. <laughs> we should mention it, right? We, we, are, we are thinking of putting together a book with readings, just like readings, written by people in other nationalities, in other countries. In this case, the Portuguese speaking countries. So that's one thing that we can do too. We can combine, maybe use part of that reading in the textbook, but you're gonna have another book just with resources, pictures and readings, cultural readings from the Portuguese speaking countries. So if you feel that you'd like to participate with uh, you know, some part of the writing on that, uh, it would be great too. Just email us. Okay, on behalf of everyone, um, thank you again for joining us and have a lovely day. Thank you so much. All right, thank bye. you. Bye. bye.